How do we know that we know? You know, it says in the scripture, the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh came, uh, came to Jeremiah when Jeremiah was just a young, uh, probably a, an older teenager. And the word said to Jeremiah, um, before, you, uh, before you were in the womb, before you were conceived, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Um, now, this is not a moment when, um, you know, Jeremiah gets sort of a simple little text or something from God. This is Jeremiah being overwhelmed by the presence of God, by the reality of God. And um, God says, before you were conceived, before there was any thought of you by your parents, um, I knew you. The word there for all you Seinfeld fans is yada. Uh, before, uh, before you were conceived, uh, before you in the womb, I yadded you. I knew you. Um, the first place we find that word in the Bible is in Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew his wife Eve and she had a son, Cain. It is the most intimate kind of knowing. That's how Jeremiah is known. And then he goes on to say, um, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Well, that word is one of my favorites in Hebrew. It's gadosh, or sometimes gadosh, depending on, on, the, on the sentence. It means made holy. And in fact, it means, it means uh, before you were born, I determined you would manifest my holiness. You would manifest my presence. I would set you aside for this. Kadosh. Uh, and so it is. And Jeremiah um, is given a very difficult job by God. Uh, if you read the book of the prophet, it is a torturous, it's a torturous ministry. Uh, but he is living uh, with the purpose that God has given him. Now, let me make a bold statement here that should unsettle you before our speakers give their testimonies. And that is, the same thing that was said to Jeremiah is being said to you. God doesn't play favorites. Before you were conceived, before you were even a thought by your parents, God knew you. He spoke you into existence in his mind before you came into existence and he knows you intimately. And before you were born, he had already determined your purpose. He had set you aside to be holy. The problem that we deal with is that we don't know that we know. And we think that uh, we can be voyeuristic in our faith and it cannot be done. I'm so proud of our uh, Renewal Works folks because they know that. And so listen to their testimonies today. And perhaps you and I will learn how to know that we know. Good morning, everybody. The last time our committee was invited up here to speak with you, we shared our rule of common life. And we talked about how we're going to commit to these eight rules together. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the ministry areas of Christ Church. With a church of our size, we are, of course, involved in ministries all over the city. But everything we do can be thought of generally in these four categories, which is worship, formation, evangelism, and outreach. As our committee worked through our recommendations, we looked again at our mission statement, which as a reminder, is drawing, changing, and sending people through Christ. And we asked ourselves, how are we doing that in each of our four committed ministry areas? How are we drawing people through worship? How are we changing people while they're worshiping with us? And how are we sending people through worship? How are we drawing, changing, and sending through formation, through evangelism, through outreach? So we worked our mission statement into our committed areas of ministry, and we made detailed recommendations, which we're not going to get into today. They're all available for you in the report that's been sent out. But what we're here to talk to you about today is how those ministry areas have shaped us and how we thought about these areas as we worked through Renewal Works. I'm here to talk to you today about worship. 
As Episcopalians, we believe that in worship, we unite ourselves with others to acknowledge the holiness of God and to hear God's word, to offer prayer, and to celebrate the sacraments. None of us can grow into our full potential as followers of Christ in a vacuum. Worshiping together as a community is the foundation and the touchstone of my Christian life. Throughout my life as a Christian and a follower of Christ, I've surrounded myself by community through Bible studies, through volunteer opportunities, through sitting on committees. But each of those things are only for a season. The one true constant that I look back on and that I turn to again and again is this community worship on Sunday mornings. My parents drug me to church from before I can remember, and we went every Sunday. When I left for college and graduate school, admittedly, my attendance waned. But when I felt untethered or needed to remember who I was, I found a Sunday service, and I worshiped in community. When Mike and I got married and we started a family, we understood what this meant to us and to our children. And we bounced around. You've heard our story, the Catholic, the Southern Baptist. We were Methodists. We were Lutherans. We finally found our home in the Episcopal Church. And we come now every Sunday with our children. Um, during Renewal Works, like I said, we asked ourselves, how are we drawing, changing, and sending people through ministry? And we started to think about how can we more fully embed the Bible in worship? How can we create purposeful peace for contemplation? How can we give a clear and concise call to action every Sunday? A lot of these changes are going to be subtle. You might not notice them. But just know that we are focused and committed to living out our mission statement in worship and to giving our communal worship that feeling of being a touchstone and a foundation and creating that space of peace. Many years ago, I was asked to be a part of the committee that created our mission statement, drawing, changing, and sending people out through the power of Christ. For me, I did not realize at the time that this was the beginning of the answer to my question, what exactly is formation? And serving on this committee began an incredible journey of spiritual growth for me and led me into more and more deepening of my faith. My journey began growing with volunteering to teach pre-K, which is pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, summer Sunday school for 10 straight years. For three years in a row, I was blessed to be asked to take in some children that are a very special group of children in my heart. These children were taken away, they were removed from their homes and put into a group home setting with their house parents. Each Sunday, their house parents would dress them in their Sunday best. It was so cute, little boys in their ties, bow ties and everything, and they would attend my Sunday school class. They always wanted to make sure that they had a seat there. They were children of all ages, and it wasn't until I was teaching the lesson on Moses and the burning bush that two of the older children came up and said they wanted to be baptized. After the lesson, my heart just kind of filled with joy. My smile got really big, and I helped them get into baptismal class. They finished, and they were baptized. It was an honor and a blessing to stand beside their godparents at their baptism. I am excited to see our parish grow with the curriculum orange, as many of us found out last week. And while continuing to teach, God was calling me to grow even more and kind of enter that deepening stage. This is where I was blessed to become a part of the Bad Girls Bible Study. This was a group of women that were in the de deepening and centering stage of their lives in the spiritual continuum and their faith, and they taught me so much about life, about the Bible, about Patrick's wonderful Bible questions, study questions. Yes, we almost, yeah, I pulled our hair out on some of them, but they were great. Anyway, one special person that really holds a special place in my heart is one of the ladies, Carol Pfeiffer. She was a very dear friend of mine, and she taught me how to step it up 
during times of adversity and even death. We have some exciting news about the fall renewal groups. We're going to keep what we have because it's working. As my late father said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we're also going to add some new renewal groups in so that we can all practice the commitment of the rule of our common life. In January 2022, God called me to come and listen to Justin Early. This was life-changing for me in the growing of my faith and into the deepening stage. The class was offered on Wednesday evenings, and the simple yet very effective way that he taught through the book and my facilitators taught the class had a profound impact not only on me, but on my mother, Barbara Galloway, who watches online each Sunday and Wednesday. Each week, I would make new friends in class and even gain an ama- gained an amazing friend outside of class. This new friend and I, we touch base daily, we pray together, we share meals together, and we're just a gift to each other at any time, any season of our life. We are proud to announce Revive. This is an exciting Wednesday evening group of lay leaders deepening them to become spiritual leaders. And in closing, God is drawing the children and adults of this congregation to grow, deepen, and center their faith through formation to be sent out into this world through the power of Christ. Good morning. Evangelism is about spreading the message of Christ. This is not only by words, but by deeds and action, through service. Christ came to serve, not to be served. First century Christians served within their community. They supported one another. They fed one another. They clothed one another. This is about the message of Christ and in a form, is in a form of evangelism. We are commissioned by our baptismal covenant. We're marked by the cross. We share the cross, which is evangelism by word. And then we pick up the cross and move forward in Jesus. That's action. So evangelism is not only about words, but about action. And in a local story that I heard Friday night that I felt was appropriate to add, that in 1869, there was a cholera epidemic here in San Antonio. There were no nurses, very few doctors. So the uh, bishop in Galveston sent three medically trained nuns from Galveston by buckboard to San Antonio. On the way, the building that had been prepared for them burnt to the ground. But that didn't stop them. They kept coming. They had the grace of God looking over them. They came and they quelled the uh, cholera epidemic. They built a nursing school and uh, obviously a university all in due time. They were protected by God and the 44 caliber pistol that one of the nuns carried with her. (laughs) But it was still God's action. I initially came to Christ Church. Uh, It was because of a death. I returned because I was welcome and felt included. This inclusiveness drew me farther into the church and into Christ, and eventually into service within the church, as well as strengthening my beliefs. Well, as you know, the church are people, all of you. It was your example, your love of Christ, your prayer, your study. Wow, was I impressed. I mean, I didn't know anything about this stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm meeting people who are quoting chapter and verse. See, I came here, and I got wrapped up in this. I was pulled in. I did all the O's. 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. I mean, I started 
going to buy, uh, adult formation, it was called that time, 10-10 class. And I started going to classes and learning, sit there with people like Tom Harden or Martha Curry, and I'm going, I have no idea what they're talking about. But I learned. Uh, you know, and then I started going to Wednesday night adult formation. That was a good meal, plus I learned a lot. You have to understand that coming on Wednesday night was a big step for me. Prior to coming to Christ Church, I was a Christian CEO. That meant I sort of practiced my Christianity Christmas, Easter only. <laughs> and now I, I'm immersed in it. I attend Bible study. I attend adult formation. I uh, do sidewalk Saturday. And I usher, I LEM, et cetera. You know, if I have any questions, I have people, I have resources. I have Eric Fenton. I have Patrick. Of course, Patrick always comes with a bibliography. You have to read all of these books. <laughs> but it's, it's worthwhile reading it. My wife shudders when the message comes because I start ordering books from Amazon. <laughs> But it's okay, so for a good reason. Now, understand that all of these things I became involved in, I was influenced by the actions of people. These may seem like small actions of others, evangelists, if you will. will. Uh, who, helped me, who helped bring me to this point in my spiritual journey, my spiritual growth. And I, I'm, God's not done with me yet, I hope because I haven't learned it all, um, and probably never will. These seemingly small acts are important, made through Christ. Acts of evangelism don't have to be large, but when performed um, and communicated through, through the message of Christ can have significant impact. It did on me, that's what all I can say. It doesn't take a great effort either. It just takes a spiritual mindfulness. Maybe that's too new age, but anyway, you got, you got to think about it. You know, keeping the two great commandments of Christ in mind. And they have to be in your heart and your mind. Service acted out in this way brings joy. It brings joy to the recipient and brings joy to the giver. Think about what you gain by having joy in your heart by service to Christ. It's, it's huge. Well, as I said, I came to Christ Church out of respect for an individual who died. And I return because of the inclusiveness. But I stay because of the people who love Christ and serve in his name daily. Those individuals, in my mind, are true evangelists. I was drawn to outreach because I think Jesus gives us the perfect example of how to meet people where they are. He met us on streets, meets us in the mountains, meets us on the roads, he meets us in our homes. And most of the times, he just stops and listens. Outreach is how we listen. That's where relationships are formed and transformation happens. When I moved to San Antonio, I didn't know anybody but my dad. And we were in the middle of a pandemic. The only social interaction I typically had was with my dad at the dinner table, on Teams meetings at work, and on, at Sidewalk Saturday. I'm a total introvert. so. I typically found myself at the coffee cart, which gave me something to do. I didn't have a whole lot of deep conversations, but I learned people's names. Those names have turned into relationships. Every Saturday that I'm not there, the next week, Nifa comes up to me and asks me in Spanish why I wasn't there. <laughs> that gives me a really great test of if I know my past tense verbs in Spanish. <laughs> Yesterday, Anthony came up to me to tell me all about his new job. I asked about a mutual friend, and he told me about how he was encouraging them. He smiled at me with a glean in his eye and said, he's getting there. A takeaway from our Renewal Works Committee 
was to emphasize the drawing, changing, and sending people in the power of Christ. This has really taken form on Saturday mornings. We now have a service and communion once a month, and we also are praying as a group afterwards. One Sunday, after everyone had wrapped up, they stood in a circle, and they began to sing. We are waiting in the light of prayer. We are waiting in the light of prayer. This reminder reminded me how important it is to thank God in the midst of outreach for what he has called us to be. Thank you again for your time this morning. We hope that you share our enthusiasm about the work that we have ahead of us. We would love to share more if you want any details about the report you know where to find us and we're happy to send it again patrick thank you for sharing your time with us this morning don't move don't move <laughs> this is what i love about this church now uh something lisa our chairman didn't tell you but uh yes lisa and mike and their children are here but now lisa's parents the slatteries are here um Lisa Galloway, uh, talk about the Bad Girls Bible Study, and of course it was a it was a a, a, a Bible study. A, I say a serious one. It was sort of laced with all sorts of cheap wine, but um, <laughs> um, but um, but it's yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> but the greatest testimony of that Bible study is when Carol Pfeiffer was dying an agonizing death, and they stayed with her, and I mean at her bedside that was moved into the living room until the moment she died. That's, that's a real church. Uh, of course, Earl Stanley has spent his entire life healing badly broken children of orthopedic, of tremendous orthopedic injury and maladies. And now, coming here, he heals our spirits, and he teaches with Scott, so he's got a lot to do. I mean... <laughs> Uh, Marissa Roth, as I've said many times, is an SEC champion athlete um, and has been nothing but a joy to all of us, certainly to Kay and me. But this morning at 7.30, her father was sitting in the fourth pew. This is what happens when Christ gets a hold of your life. I ask you to thank these good people. 